I want to tell you a few uh, stories tonight, and I'm going to take a little longer than I typically take uh, when I deliver a message. Usually I try to preach around 35 to 40 minutes. Tonight is probably going to be closer to like 45 or 50 minutes, but I got something that I really want to share with you. I think it's very important. I'm going to tell you some stories about how God leads us and how God guides us. Uh, the title for the message tonight is God Directs Our Steps. And basically, we're only going to have one verse that we're going to look at tonight. Here's the key verse that we're going to focus on. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9 says, A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Folks, there have been many instances that I can think of in my lifetime in which I had planned how things were going to work out, but in the end, God orchestrated things differently than I had planned. Can anybody relate to that? Amen. But when I looked back on it, I could see every single time, I could see crystal clear how God led me from point A to point B to point C to get me to where I am today. Amen. Now, two weeks ago, um, I wasn't here. Uh, I went to Iowa to spend some time with uh, my family. My parents celebrated their 50th anniversary. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, Pastor Rodney Lewis was here, and he preached for me while I was away. But uh, I was out of state. I was up in Iowa. And I don't know about you, but whenever I travel, uh, when I'm not here in town, when I'm not in this area, I always try to eat at places that I can't eat at at home. I, 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 are you like that? I mean, I don't, when I go on the road, I don't want to eat at McDonald's or Applebee's or something like that. I can get that at home. I want to experience something that I can't experience at home. So whenever I go to Columbus, Ohio, I always get some Warsu Gai. That's, that's a Chinese dish. I cannot get Warsu Gai anywhere other than Columbus, Ohio. I've never found it anywhere. You can't get it here in Naples. Whenever I go to Iowa, I try to get a loose meat hamburger. You guys have heard me talk about that before. There's some people are like, what's a, what, what's a loose meat hamburger? It's kind of like a sloppy joe, but without the sloppy joe sauce. Okay, And you dress it up like a regular hamburger. You put ketchup, mustard, pickle, cheese, whatever you want on it. But it's loose meat, not a, not a hamburger patty. But another thing that I try to do whenever I go to Iowa and I visit my parents is I go to Pizza Hut. You say, well, why would you go to Pizza Hut? You got Pizza Hut here in Naples. Well, Pizza Hut in Iowa offers something different than I can get here in Naples. There's a, there's a pizza there called uh, Pizza Hut Taco Pizza. You, you can't get it here in Naples. And basically, it's, uh, it's pizza with kind of a taco meat with taco seasoning on it. I think it has refried beans on it. It's got lettuce and tomato on it. And then they crumble Doritos on top of it. And it is so good. It's so good. And you can't get it here. You can't get it in Naples, which is a sin. It, it should be available here. But uh, I went to Pizza Hut. I, I had ordered my pizza, and I had, I had ordered it to go. And when I got to Pizza Hut, it wasn't quite ready yet. So I was uh, standing in the foyer waiting for my pizza. And I saw this picture hanging on the wall. And I decided to take a picture of the picture. Because as I was sitting there in the restaurant, I'm waiting for my carryout order, I saw this picture and God dropped an entire message in my spirit in just a few moments. And that's the message you're gonna hear tonight. Because this man, believe it or not, plays a significant role in the ministry of Faith Life Worship Center. This is a man named Ivan Tennyson. And the reason Ivan's picture was on the wall at that Pizza Hut was he built and owned that Pizza Hut. Now, Ivan's been dead for several years, but he was the owner of that Pizza Hut. And he actually, at one point in his lifetime, he owned and operated 22 Pizza Huts in the Midwest. And you say, well, how do you know so much about this guy, Ivan Tennyson? Well, I know because my dad was his personal pilot. 
So my dad flew for I Ivan Tennyson. He began flying for him in the late 90s. And Ivan uh, lived in Iowa in the winter, or, or in the summer, I'm sorry. But in the winter, they would come down to Naples. And so they were down in Naples about six to seven months out of the, out of the year. And so my dad came down to Naples every year and uh, wintered with Ivan and his wife. My dad had his own condo down here, and uh, Ivan and his wife also had a condo. So around the same time that my dad started flying for Ivan, uh, back in 1998, I came down to Naples, and I interviewed to be the worship pastor for a church here in town called New Hope Ministries. And so when I was down here in 98, uh, I was 23 years old at the time, and I was a little more radical than I am now. I'm 49. I've slowed down a little bit. But when I was 23, I was a little more radical. And if I can just be completely honest, back in 1998, New Hope Ministries was a little more stuffy than they are today. So uh, it, it really wasn't a fit. Um, I actually came down to New Hope twice and led, for, led worship for them two different times in early 1998. But it wasn't a fit at the time. But even though it wasn't a fit, uh, I was impressed with the church and I was impressed with the leadership of the church. And so I told my dad, I said, look, if you're going to be living in Naples for half of the year, there's a really good church over on Davis Boulevard and you ought to check them out. And so my dad started attending New Hope Ministries. Now, over the years, uh, my career continued on. I worked for several churches over the next several years. I wrote many songs. I produced several recording projects. I won the Gospel Music Association Song of the Year Award for Praise and Worship Songwriting. I worked for several churches, including Gary Cassie's ministry. Gary Cassie has been here and preached at our church. I worked for Kenneth Copeland. I was the worship pastor for Eagle Mountain International Church back in 2007 and 8. And so I, I had a really good career. Well, fast forward 14 years from the time that I interviewed at New Hope. And uh, at this point, it was 2012. I was not serving full time as a worship pastor anywhere. I was a contract musician for a large church in Alabama. And so I would play trumpet or I'd play keys or sing on the platform or just whatever they needed from me. I was a contract musician and I was a day trader. I was trading uh, market index futures and I had a small group of traders that were following me and we were trading together. I would make the trade calls and we would all trade together. And I was getting ready to start my own day trading company. And I was literally days away from starting this company when in March of 2012, my family and I, we went on a trip to Mobile, Alabama. It was a homeschool field trip. A bunch of homeschoolers got together and we went down to Mobile, Alabama. And we were getting ready to go to a museum one morning and we were getting ready, we were in the hotel room and I was praying and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, if you start this day trading company, you are going to disqualify yourself from something that I have for you that's right around the corner. Now, when he spoke that to me, I knew the Holy Spirit spoke to me, but I had no idea what he was talking about. Because, I mean, what could God have for me that's right around the corner? I haven't interviewed anywhere. I haven't sent out any resumes or any applications anywhere. Uh, I had not planned on going into any other ministry uh, vocations other than what I was doing at that time. And it turns out that the very same week that God spoke that to me, New Hope Ministries worship leader quit. And so my dad gave me a call because dad was uh, attending New Hope at that time. And he said, I'm going to give you some information that uh, you, you can do whatever you want with this information. I said, okay. He said, New Hope Ministries uh, worship pastor just quit. And I said, all right. And I kind of chewed on that for a couple of days. 
And like I said, I wasn't looking for a, a ministry position, but I called Pastor Grant over at New Hope. And I didn't even know if he would remember me. It had been 14 years since I had been at, uh, to his church, but he did remember me. And I told him, I said, look, I know that you're looking for a worship pastor. I am not looking for a job right now. I'm happy with what I'm doing, but I'm not serving anywhere in a ministry capacity. I'm just a contract musician for a church. And so if you would like, I can come down to Naples. I can stay in my dad's condo. And uh, as long as dad has an internet connection, I can do my day trading from the condo. That's fine. And why don't you let me come down to Naples and I will serve as an interim worship leader while you look for your next worship leader. Because I had remembered 14 years prior to this, it really wasn't a fit, but I, I can come down and I can help them out while they're looking for somebody else. Now, I, I didn't expect to come down to Naples and fall in love with the church. And they fell in love with me. And I knew almost immediately that this was where God wanted us to bring, to, to start our next assignment. I knew that, that this, this is what God was doing. And so I knew that they were going to offer me a job and I knew that I was going to take it and I didn't even know what the salary was. I just know I was supposed to be in Naples. Now here's where the story gets really interesting and a little curious. I had not been given the job offer yet, but I knew that it was coming and I knew that I was going to say yes to it. And I had just made that decision that I was going to move my family to Naples and I was going to work for New Hope Ministries. And I went out to lunch with Pastor Grant and we were driving back to the church after lunch when I got a phone call and my mom had called me and told me Ivan Tennyson had died. Now, I was a little concerned, not only because he had died, but I kind of wondered what was going to happen to my dad's job because he was Ivan's pilot. And I had been looking forward to being able to see my dad for six or seven months out of the year because we were going to be in the same town now. And now I didn't even know if he was going to have a job. Turned out he did still have a job. They, they kept him on for several years, even after uh, Ivan passed away. But here was the part that was very curious when I looked back at it. Ivan passed immediately after I had decided to come to Naples. Immediately after I had made that connection to Naples. Ivan was literally getting dressed one morning. As he was getting dressed, he fell over, he bounced off the bed, and he hit the floor. And medical personnel came and saw him. They said he was likely dead before he hit the floor. Just gone in an instant right after Heath Jarvis made a connection to Naples, Florida. So two weeks ago, I'm sitting in this pizza hut. I'm looking at Ivan's picture on the wall and all of a sudden it dawns on me. If Ivan Tennyson had never hired my dad, if Ivan Tennyson had never wintered in Naples, if my dad had never attended New Hope Ministries, if Ivan had died just a few weeks sooner, it's possible that I never would have made that connection to Naples and I wouldn't be your pastor today. This man hanging on the wall who you have never met before had a significant impact on your life and you never even met him. Now, something else happened in 2012 I had a conversation with God after I came down to Naples. We hadn't bought a house yet. Uh, I don't think I actually was an employee of New Hope Ministries yet, but I knew that I was gonna be down here. I knew that we were gonna relocate our family. We were, we were gonna sell our house in Alabama. I knew I was coming to Naples and I asked God, I said, why Lord? I said, why are you bringing me to Naples now instead of 14 years ago? because there was an opportunity for me to come here in 1998 and that didn't happen. I said, Lord, why are you bringing me here now? God said, I didn't bring you to Naples 14 years ago because if I had, you wouldn't still be here. 
There would have been another opportunity that would have come along and you would have taken that. You wouldn't be here in Naples. And I need you in Naples now because I'm bringing you to Naples to pastor. Now, I kept that to myself for a long, long time. But I knew that God was bringing me to Naples to pastor. If I had brought you here 14 years ago, that would have been your plan. That wouldn't have been mine. Man's heart plans his way, but God directs his steps. Now, I can track other events in my life that have helped form the framework of what brought me to where I am in my life today. When I was 10 years old, my parents separated. They were having trouble in their marriage, and they separated for a year. Now, we had lived in Detroit, Michigan, or in the Detroit area, and when my parents separated, my mom took me and my two little brothers, and we moved to Iowa to be closer to my mom's family and all of her siblings. And so when we left the Detroit area, we left a school system that did not have a music program. But when we went to Iowa, that school system did have a music program. And so during the year that my parents separated, I learned how to play the trumpet because I was in that school system that had a, uh, a music program. Actually, I didn't learn how to play the trumpet. I learned how to play the cornet, which cornet and trumpet are very similar instruments. But we couldn't afford a trumpet. We couldn't afford uh, any instrument. My aunt's sister had a coronet and she said, uh, I played this in high school and you can use this for free if you want. So we picked the coronet because it was free. And so I learned how to play the coronet and I played coronet for a year. Then God restored my parents' marriage. And it was an awesome thing to experience. I mean, I, I saw the transformation in my parents' life. My dad got born again. My mom rededicated her life to the Lord. I got born again through three separate different things that happened all within about two or three months of each other. God restored their relationship, restored their marriage, and we moved back to the Detroit area and we were a family again. And it was powerful. And then in sixth grade, I'm going to a school that doesn't have a music program, so I didn't play the trumpet in sixth grade. But in seventh grade, my school system hired a brand new band director to restart their music program. And so he started a high school band and a junior high band, and the high school band only had 15 members in it. So the band director went down to the junior high and he said, I wanna make an appeal to anybody here in the junior high band if you have previous music experience, you can try out for the high school band. So that night, my parents and me, we went to the local music store and my parents bought me a trumpet for $100. Bought me a trumpet, I took the trumpet home, I played for it a, a, a little bit, I hadn't played in a year. I played a little bit, I figured out a few scales, and I figured out how to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and Mary had a little lamb. And the next morning, I did my audition for the band director. I played Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, Mary had a little lamb, and two or three scales. And I told him, I said, I played for a year in fifth grade, I didn't play at all in sixth grade, and I have not played in a year other than last night when we bought this trumpet. And the band director said, well, if that's what you can do after just working you know, one evening after not playing for a year, I think you got some potential. You're in the high school band. And so I was in the high school band from seventh grade all the way through 12th grade. I was in the high school band for six years. Now, my high school band director was a Christian and he was a professional trumpet player. And he knew that I was a Christian and I was a trumpet player. And I think he saw a lot of himself in me. And so what he did all throughout junior high and high school, he took me under his wing. And he, he poured into me, probably more so than he did any other student in our, in our school. I, I had a little favoritism. <laughs> 
But because he took me under his wing, I ended up developing many of the musical skills that propelled me into my career as a professional musician, as a minister of music. So if you think about it, if my parents hadn't split up for a year, I never would have had previous band experience. And I wouldn't have been in the high school band in seventh grade. If my mom had had enough money to get me the instrument that I really wanted to get, see, I didn't want to play trumpet. I wanted to play saxophone. Because saxophone's cool. Especially in the 80s, okay? I mean, there were sax solos on every Huey Lewis song, right? I wanted to play saxophone. We didn't have the money for that. So if my mom had had enough money to get me a saxophone, then it's possible that my band director might not have taken me under his wing like he did because he didn't play saxophone. He played trumpet. <laughs> so I might not have ever become the accomplished musician that I became and my accomplishments as a musician are what propelled me into ministry and so if that never happened I might not be your pastor today you see how all that kind of comes together a man's heart plans his way but God directs his steps when I was in high school my dad had quit his job as a corporate pilot and he was promised a job uh, flying for a large ministry in Columbus, Ohio. And so we put our house up for sale in the Detroit area. We moved the whole family down to Columbus, Ohio because dad had this opportunity to fly for a very well-known ministry. And what had happened was the pilot of that ministry, he was the chief pilot, he told my dad, he said, I'm getting ready to retire. So what I'm gonna do he said, I fly for this ministry and I fly for the Air Force Reserves. So I'm going to retire from flying for the ministry. I'm going to fly for the Air Force Reserves for another four or five years and then I'm going to retire altogether. Well, right after we moved to Columbus, Ohio, that pilot got a call from the Air Force and they said, we're getting ready to move our squadron from Columbus, Ohio to Illinois. So you can move to Illinois, or we're gonna let you take early retirement. So what he decided to do was he took early retirement from the Air Force Reserve and decided to fly for the ministry for another four or five years and then retire. Well, guess what that meant? My dad didn't have a job. That job went away. So here we were in Columbus, Ohio. We had moved the whole family down there. And now we're a part of this ministry. I'm going to church at this awesome church. And while we were at that church, I saw something and experienced something that I had never seen before in my life. A dynamic, cutting edge, contemporary, spirit-filled, spirit-led, energetic praise and worship ministry. Never seen anything like this before. And it was a truly life-altering experience for me. And I joined the praise team of that church. I played trumpet, I played organ, I sang in the choir. And I had never seen a, a praise and worship ministry like this before. Now, when I was in high school, I had told God, I said, Lord, I know that I have a great gift for music and I want to use my gift for you. And Lord, I'll do anything that you want me to do, but I don't want to go to Bible college and I don't want to be a church music director. Now, the reason I didn't want to be involved with church music is that all throughout junior high and high school, I had done a lot of professional and semi-professional work as a trumpet player. And in all of my travels and everything that I had done, I had done secular gigs, I had done Christian gigs, and uh, I, I, had, I was a part of a tour group for a summer. We toured the Midwest. In everything that I had done, the church had the least amount of excellence. The church was 40 to 50 years behind the world when it came to musical styles. The church had the least amount of professionalism, the least amount of accountability. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to have any part of it. Lord, I want to do something for you, but I want to do something great. And I don't want to be a part of something that's not done in excellence. So here we were, we're living in Columbus, Ohio. 
My dad still did not have a good paying job. And I wanted to go to college in Nashville, Tennessee. Because look, if you're gonna be, if you're gonna have a career in music, Nashville is where to start, right? And what I wanted to do, I wanted to become a contemporary songwriter. That's what I wanted to do. I, I knew I was a good trumpet player, but I knew I wasn't a good enough trumpet player to make a living at it. But I thought, I can learn how to be a good songwriter. So I got accepted and enrolled at Belmont University in Nashville, and my major was contemporary music composition. I was gonna be a songwriter. Here's the problem. We didn't have any money to send me to school. My dad didn't have a good paying job. And so he told me, he says, I can't, I can't afford to send you to Nashville. Why don't you do this? This church that we're a part of, they have a Bible college. Why don't you go to Bible college? Now, what did I tell God I didn't want to do? I didn't want to go to Bible college. And I told Dad, I said, I don't want to go to Bible college. Everybody going to that Bible college is going for the same reason. They want to go into the ministry. I don't want to go into the ministry. Actually, there was two reasons they were, go they were going to that Bible college. One, they wanted to go into the ministry. And two, they wanted to find a godly spouse. Because a, a lot of young Christian ladies are looking for their MRS degree. <clears throat> so, I said, I, I, I don't want to go to Bible college. I want to be a, a, a songwriter. And Dad said this. He said, you want to be a Christian songwriter? I said, yes. He said, well, don't you think that you need to have something to write about? Why don't you go to Bible college for just a year, get some word in you, and then a year from now, we'll see if we can send you down to Nashville. So for the first three months of Bible college, I was bitter. I'm telling you, I didn't want to be there. I, I was a grumpy person. And... Uh, one morning, I'd been in college for about three months. One morning, I'm getting ready to start my first class of the day. Class starts at 7.30 a.m. It's about 7.15, 7.20 in the morning. I'm sitting there in the classroom, and I'm praying. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And he said, you don't want to go into church music ministry because you haven't seen excellence in the church. But I am calling you into church music ministry to bring excellence to the church. And from that moment on, my entire attitude completely changed. I, I realized, okay, this is what I'm called to do. And folks, that's what I did for 25 years. Every ministry that hired me for the next 25 years, they hired me for the same purpose. Bring excellence to our church music ministry. Bring us up to speed in church music. But I want you to think about this. If that guy had not promised my dad a job, we wouldn't have moved to Columbus, Ohio. And I never would have seen that amazing praise and worship ministry, which totally took the limits off of what I thought was possible in church music. And if I never went to that church, I never would have met Louise. Because that's where I met her and that's where we got uh, married. And even if we had made it to Columbus, Ohio, if my dad had gotten that job that they promised him, we would have had money to send me to Nashville. And I never would have gone to Bible college. And I wouldn't be your pastor today. And we wouldn't have Louise. Or Jessica. Or Caleb. Or Laddie and Robin. <laughs> Man's heart plans his way. God directs his steps. Now, while I was in Bible college, one of my Bible college instructors came up to me. This was right after I had uh, finished my first year of Bible college. He came up to me and he said, uh, there's a church in Indiana that's looking for a worship pastor, and I think you're the guy. And I said, well, I really appreciate that, but I'm not planning on going into the ministry uh, I'm going to stay for a second year of Bible college. Remember, I'm the guy that didn't want to go to Bible college. And now I'm saying I want to stick around for a second year. And he said, well, here's what you should do. He said, the guy who started this church in Indiana, 
he commuted back and forth. He went to Bible college uh, for his second year, and he started that church during his second year of college. So why don't you just do that? Just commute back and forth. And so that's what I did. I went over there. I interviewed. got hired for the job. I had an apartment in Columbus, Ohio. I had an apartment in Huntington, Indiana. And I traveled back and forth. And I drove 1,000 miles a week. I put 30,000 miles on my car in six months. But if that Bible college instructor had not taken the initiative to reach out to me and connect me with that ministry that needed a worship leader, who knows if I would have ever gone into the ministry. Maybe some other opportunity would have presented itself and I would have gone that direction. Or even if I did go into the ministry, maybe my career would have looked completely different than it did. If just one circumstance was changed, if just one conversation never happened, if just one connection was never made, my life could have been on a completely different path. And I might not be your pastor today. Right before I got married, I was working for a very dynamic church pastor. He had come from Louisiana. He had pastored a large church in Louisiana. And uh, God had called him to start a church in Cincinnati, Ohio. Cincinnati's a couple hours from Columbus. And my sister-in-law connected me with this guy. And he came to Cincinnati and he, uh, he interviewed me. And he said, I want you to be my worship pastor. We're going to start a church together. Our very first church service had seven people in attendance. Very first service, seven people. Two months later, we were running 120 people. And a month after that, we were running 200 people. Three months, we were running 200 people. We had explosive growth. And so I had been working for him for about three months, and uh, I, I had a person there that uh, came up to me uh, after about three months, and they said, look, I've been to every spirit-filled church in Cincinnati. He said, this church has, hands down, the greatest praise and worship ministry in the city of Cincinnati. And I said, wow, thank you so much. And here I was, I was on staff there for about three months, and one Sunday morning, the pastor called me into his office, Sunday afternoon, after service, and he said, you know, you're commuting back and forth between Columbus and Cincinnati. Can we get you down here full time? And I said, yes, uh, you can. I'm actually working towards that. Because at the time, I was working part time for a bank, and I was working part time for this church. And I said, I've already spoken with my bank, and they have branches here in Cincinnati. They are willing to transfer me to Cincinnati. I said, on top of that, I'm engaged to be married. I'm going to be married in four months. I said, my fiance has a house of her own. She's already looking at putting the house up for sale, and we're looking for houses here in Cincinnati. So give me four months, and we're going to be down here full time, plugged in, because I'm excited to be a part of this ministry. I'm excited to see what God's going to do. That was a Sunday afternoon. Five days later, he fired me. <laughs> now, I didn't find out until four years later why he fired me. Because he didn't tell me. He didn't tell me why he was firing me. Actually, what he said was, he goes, I don't know if I'm just getting older or what it is, but you're just not what I'm looking for in a worship leader. And I thought, what a 180 from what you said five days ago. I found out later that the reason that he fired me was that there was a pastor in Cincinnati who was getting ready to retire. And that pastor told my pastor, he said, if you, uh, if you want, you can take over my building because I'm getting ready to retire. You can take over the lease on my building. And if you do, you'll probably get most of my people as well. And he said, I, I'm glad to do this. I'll just turn the whole facility over to you. I, I'm getting ready to retire. You're building something that's brand new, and you can have my building. But if you take my building, you got to take my worship leader too. Because uh, I'm retiring, and I don't want to leave my worship leader hung out to dry. So my pastor left me hung out to dry, and he fired me. 
But right after he fired me, I gave Gary Cassie a call. And I said, hey, um, I, I administered at his church a few times. And I, I said, uh, can you give me a letter of recommendation because I'm sending promotional packets out to different churches to promote my ministry, my itinerant ministry, because I'm traveling on the road. And Gary said, sure, I'll, I'll write you a letter of recommendation. But while I have you on the phone, my worship leader likes to take the summers off on our midweek services because he's a school teacher. And he's off in the summer. He doesn't work in the summer. And he doesn't like leading worship on our Wednesday night services. Can you lead worship for us on Wednesday nights? I said, sure, I would love to. And so I started leading worship for him on Wednesday nights. And then a few months later, they just decided to hire me full time as their worship pastor. Now, if that guy in Cincinnati had never fired me, I never would have worked for Gary Cassie. And I can tell you this. Had I not worked for Gary Cassie, it's very possible that I never would have had children. Because when Louise and I first got married, we, we really didn't want kids. I can't even imagine not wanting kids now. But we really didn't want kids when we first got married. But when we started going to Gary Cassie's church, we saw all of these amazing families and amazing godly children and wonderful, powerful marriages. And we saw people doing it right. And we said, man, I want some of that. I, I want what they have. So it's possible that I never would have had children. Now, when Louise was pregnant with Jessica, we were living in a, about a 1,000 square foot house, 1,100 square foot house, something like that. Louise worked out of the home. I worked out of the home. And it was a small little house. And now we've got a baby on the way. We needed a bigger house. And so we began searching for a house. And we knew what we were looking for. We knew how many bedrooms we needed, how many square feet and all that kind of stuff and the kind of yard that we wanted. And we looked and we looked and we looked and we looked and I was getting burned out looking at houses. And we finally found a house that fit the bill, checked all the boxes. Because we also wanted a house that wasn't too far from where I was working. I was working for Gary Cassie's church at that time. And we put an offer on that house and then they, they countered us. They gave us a counter offer. You guys have played the game before, right? We put an offer on the house. They gave us a counter offer. And then they called us back and they retracted their counter. They said, there's another uh, family that has put an offer on our house. We're just going to go with their offer. And I thought, what kind of realtor allows somebody to retract a counter when they have two interested buyers? Let us get in a bidding war. Let us fight over it. You'll make more money. I want that house. But they wouldn't even allow us to put another offer on it. They said, we're going with somebody else. And I was so angry. I was so mad. We searched for weeks to find this house. And so we went back to searching and looking and looking and looking. And finally, our realtor found another house for us. And it was so much better than the other house would have been. It was a better price, it was in a better location, it was bigger, it had everything that we need, and it was brand new. Brand new build, and it was in the right location. And not only that, we ended up living in that house for about four years before I had an opportunity to take a ministry position at another church. And in those four years, that house appreciated about 25%, which the other house would not have. We would have been lucky if it appreciated 5 or 10%. And not only that, when we went to sell that house, the people that we sold it to were some friends of ours, and that house was everything they needed. So if I had gotten what I wanted, it wouldn't have been as good as what God was trying to steer me towards. Amen? I made a plan. God directed my steps. So I'm saying all that to say this. One of the things that these life experiences have taught me is to not get so upset when life doesn't go exactly the way you expect it to. Because man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Maybe there's a reason that this job that you wanted never transpired. Maybe there's a reason that you didn't get that promotion at work. 
Maybe there's a reason that you just lost that huge client. Maybe there's a reason that your date canceled on you. I may not know exactly what God's plan is for me, but I do know that even if I have a specific plan for my life, regardless of how I would prefer things to unfold, I've got to trust that God will direct my steps. Folks, I had many thoughts and plans for how I thought Faith Life Worship Center's destiny would unfold. For years, I, I planned and I thought about what my church would look like and the kinds of things that we would do. You want to guess how accurate my thoughts were? This church doesn't look anything like what I imagined. It doesn't. Our building, our departments, our look, our sound, our flow, our size, our demographics, almost none of it looks, what, looks like what I had envisioned in the years before I started this church. You want to know why it doesn't look like what I thought it would? Because man's heart plans his way, but God directs his steps. And I was thinking a lot about this in recent weeks. I was thinking about this particular verse quite a bit in recent weeks. And a couple of weeks ago, Isabel came up to me and she handed me a little note card. And on that card was a verse of scripture. It was in the King James Version and then she wrote it again in the NIV. Anybody want to guess what verse it was? Proverbs 16.9. <laughs> The Jewish culture has a saying. It's a cliche in the Jewish culture. Now, I don't know how to say it in Yiddish, but uh, I'll just say it in English. The saying is this, man plans, God laughs. I'm certain that there have been many times in my life where I thought I knew what I wanted for my life, and God just chuckled at me. So what I want to say is this, as this ministry moves forward, no matter what that picture looks like, I'm always going to have a plan. I'm always going to have vision. I'm always going to have ideas. I'm always going to be thinking, okay, what's next? What's our next step? What's the next thing God wants us to do? But ultimately, in the end, it's going to be God who directs our steps. And if the way everything plays out doesn't match the picture that I had in my mind, that is completely okay. Because what we have now doesn't match the picture that I had in my mind. The number one thing that I'm concerned with, and this should be your number one thing too, the number one concern that I have is making a difference in the lives of the people that I come into contact with and furthering the cause of the kingdom. Folks, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a pastor, preacher, teacher, musician, singer, songwriter, arranger, I'm an airplane pilot, I'm a motorcycle rider, I'm a muscle car owner, I'm a toy collector, and a movie buff, and a gun enthusiast, and an artist, and a theorist, and a history buff, and a trivia buff, there's a lot of things, a lot of different aspects to me. And however God wants to use those different qualities and aspects of my life to further his kingdom is fine with me. However he wants to use it is fine with me. My kingdom purpose has nothing to do with my ego. And it has everything to do with being humble enough and moldable enough to be used in any way that he sees fit. However that looks, as long as it's what he wants. Yeah, I'll make my plans. He's going to direct my steps. And because I'm not seeking my own promotion, God will promote me in such a greater way than I could ever promote myself. So I want to say this and, I'm, and we'll close with the prospect of this possible church merger that we've been talking about for the last few weeks. Several people have expressed concerns for me and Louise. They're asking questions like this. Who's going to cast the vision? Who's going to be in charge? Who's going to do all the preaching? 
Who's going to call the shots? And I've had other people who have expressed things like this. They've said, we need to do this merger. Because, Pastor, you and Louise have too much talent and too much anointing to be used on such a small audience. we got to get you on a bigger platform, a bigger audience. And, folks, I appreciate all those concerns, but I want you to understand, a lot of those concerns revolve largely around ego. Who's going to be in charge? Who's going to do all the preaching? I'm not concerned with ego. I'm not concerned with how well my talent matches the size of my audience. I'm not concerned with calling the shots near as much as I am concerned with simply fulfilling my kingdom potential. Whatever that looks like. Because again, what my ministry looks like today isn't remotely close to what I thought it would look like when I started this church five and a half years ago. So what I have learned and what I'm still learning and what I'm hoping that all of you will come to learn as well is that we can make all of the plans that we want, but God ultimately is the one who directs our steps. Can you say amen to that tonight? God will direct your steps. Give him praise for it. Hi, I'm Heath. And I'm Louise. Thanks so much for watching. Please do us a favor and remember to like this video and subscribe to our channel. Also, comment below. Connect with us and let us know if there's anything we can pray about. If you enjoyed this video, we believe you'll enjoy it even more to visit us in person at Faith Life Worship Center in Naples, Florida. You can find Faith Life Worship Center on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, or through our website, faithlifenaples.com. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.